Welcome back for the third day. So we have a change in program. The first talk will be by Ron Eakers. Professor Ron Eakers was foundation director of CSIRO's Australia Telescope National Facility, an Australian Research Council Federation Fellow, a President of the International Astronomical Union, and has been elected a Fellow of the Royal Society for his contributions to radio astronomy and the development of techniques in the field. Earlier, Ron was the first director of the very large array in the US. Ron has forever been innovative in his research, inspiring those around him to think outside the box. Life is on the fast lane when Ron is around. Ron cannot sit still, cannot be by himself, and seems to always need someone to talk to. Right now he cannot wait to tell us everything he ever wanted us to know about his search for ultra high energy neutrinos, particle detection at radio wavelengths. Ron? Okay, thank you Ravi, that's an innovative twist on an introduction. Um, I do have a tendency to try and tell you everything, including lots of things you don't need to know, so uh, I'll try and watch myself. Um, the reason for the topic uh, became uh, unavoidable and, uh, and obvious. For the last six months, I've been involved in, uh, in an experiment, which means uh, eagerly waiting for each full moon and making observations with what was last night described as uh, Radhakrishnan's weapon of choice, the Parkes radio telescope. Um, the combination of the thousand moons um, and the insights which I've got from RAD in radio astronomy sort of forced me into giving the talk about, about the moon. So I'm going to use it as uh, an example of uh, one uh, project in radio astronomy. Uh, I'll give a little background on how I got involved with, with RAD. But I'll use uh, some observations of very short time constant radio phenomena to uh, illustrate aspects of, uh, of what you need in research environments to uh, foster innovation. Uh, this will include the uh, couple of experiments using short short radio bursts, the exploding black holes already mentioned by Peter Shaver the other day, briefly, uh, and then the topic which uh, is fascinating me at the moment, and that's searching for UHE neutrinos by their radio pulses. So there's where I'm going to try and, uh, try and go. Um, here's the uh, telescope I used to do my PhD in CSIRO in Sydney, Australia. You see the Parkes radio telescope in the background, and in the foreground is, uh, is another telescope, which is actually quite amazing because it's on a railway line and can be moved continually while observing. And the apparatus right in front is an intriguing uh, bit of machinery to uh, uh, keep you connected to the cables as the telescope is moved. So this was conceived by John Bolton. Uh, after he'd been working at Owens Valley with Rad and George and a few of the other people here. Uh, and at Owens Valley, <coughs> changing the separation between the two antennas, which form a Michelson interferometer, uh, and Glenn Berg, of course, was uh, um, a rather time-consuming affair. And uh, I later participated in that, involving use of bulldozers to nudge the telescope into its right position and, and things like that. So John thought it would be much better if we could rapidly measure all the different space Fourier components. And hence, when he came back to Australia, uh, he already uh, uh, had designed this uh, telescope in his head, and, uh, and we built it. <clears throat> A comment about the difference between uh, many students now and uh, John Bolton's students, nobody else has mentioned this, is um, the Parkes telescope had just been built. So you would imagine it would be obvious for a young student to use this 
best telescope in the world to do some astronomy and get a PhD that way. But John Bolton forbid that, forbid that. His idea was any fool could use a telescope that good and get a PhD. And as I'm taught you anything, you haven't learned anything much. So instead, you go build uh, parts of the machinery to make this moving telescope interferometer work, uh, and then, uh, then you can use it to observe, and by that process, you might have learned something uh, and certainly earned the right to get a PhD. So the style now is different, although I think maybe here in RRI, you've kept some of the John Bolton style, and I'm sure that has all been well and truly passed on to Rad as well. But anyway, by 1966, John Bolton kept promising me this Indian guru who understood everything about interferometers and would appear to help me uh, learn how to use this machine. Um, but the guru uh, had decided to go to the UK and buy a boat and sail to Australia, which took, uh, which took a year or so. Um, and so as a result, it was right at the end of my thesis where I'd had to uh, learn most of this stuff by hand where we finally uh, uh, came together. You've seen the famous, uh, this picture a few times already. So Rad did finally arrive, and uh, I had the most wonderful interactions with Rad. Uh, and perhaps I thought I knew about interferometers by that stage, but he quickly demonstrated I really knew almost nothing. Now, I'll get back in a minute to the kind of discussions I had with Rad, but to set the scene, uh, we'll talk about uh, these short time constant phenomena for a bit. And before I get to the neutrinos, I wanted to go back uh, to this uh, historical thing because it had such unexpected uh, spin offs that it's a beautiful story. It was touched on uh, by Peter Shaver. Uh, his role in this uh, you will see in a moment. Um, but anyway, this is giving uh, the history, and we also had uh, from Srinivasan in the first lecture uh, some glimpses of this. I don't know whether I've got the history exactly right. Somebody will correct me afterwards. But anyway, Stephen Hawking uh, had predicted that black holes small enough would evaporate in less than a Hubble time. So if such things were ever formed in the universe, uh, they would go off in an exponential burst as their mass went to zero and their temperature went to a very high value. Um, Mark, um, I was, in fact, at Cambridge before I came to, uh, to Westerbork, uh, where we did these experiments. So uh, I was following this absolutely fascinating development uh, with Steve Hawking at the time. Martin Rees very quickly put a model together to show that if you want to detect these things, you might have a chance by looking for radio pulses. This theory is now considered to be uh, not, uh, not viable in this form, and uh, uh, not much more uh, work has been done on the theoretical side, as far as I know, somebody here might know. But anyway, the result was that as this uh, black hole finally evaporates, it emits uh, one cycle of RF radiation at one gigahertz. So this is your ultimate uh, short pulse. Um, so if you had a gigahertz of bandwidth, this is as fast as it can go. So back in um, uh, the 1970s then, we thought we would have a crack at doing this. This is just summarizing what I said. Um, Peter Shaver had uh, come to the Netherlands then, and uh, Peter and I talked, uh, talked John O'Sullivan initially, Tim Hankins joins this story later, into building uh, a device so we could look for such short pulses of radiation. Uh, John O'Sullivan, of course, innovative engineer, had no difficulty designing some pulse detection circuits because they couldn't use any of the standard radio astronomy backends, a pulse of a nanosecond, or in this case, we only went to a microsecond, um, is a time constant which uh, uh, is, is not available. It's normally uh, uh, the design of the receivers uh, uh, doesn't really easily allow it, so you've got to get right to the, to the receiver. And in this case, he put a digital threshold uh, uh, device in. So that was good fun. We didn't see any, uh, anything which we could reasonably attribute to exploding black holes and sort of left it there, published a paper setting a, a limit. But the limit depends on the theory of making the radio pulse. Then Tim Hankins uh, came. And Tim Hankins had been 
uh, working at Bonn, uh, trying to get rid of the dispersion. So one problem you have with such a sharp pulse as it comes through the interstellar medium, it gets dispersed across uh, the arrival time changes with wavelengths, and it does so by, uh, uh, by very much uh, more than a nanosecond, so the nanosecond pulse would be completely smeared out. Um, and to recover this effect, uh, the best way to do it is to Fourier transform it, realign the Fourier components so that you can get rid of the ionospheric dispersion, uh, the uh, interstellar dispersion. Now, there were no digital computers that could do uh, anything like this, uh, certainly not in real time, because we have to do this in real time. You can't possibly record data at this rate, store it, and sort it all out in the computer later. So we needed a real-time Fourier transformer, and Tim Hankinson had built this uh, laser-based optical Fourier transformer, which wrote onto film. And uh, so Tim Hankins, uh, then later with John O'Sullivan, myself, continued messing around with this for about another year. Um, and the effect it's had on John O'Sullivan after looking through miles and miles of film for, for these things, oh, a typical event is on the left there, and that thing at 45 degrees is what you would hunt through the film looking for. Uh, this one's accompanied by another one at uh, the opposite slope, so it can't be a real signal. It was some kind of RFI. Never mind that now. So John O'Sullivan went away from that experience thinking there's got to be a better way than this bench full of optical machinery and films, and, um, and wouldn't it be neat if we could actually do a digital Fourier transform in real time? So in John's version of this, that idea then was firmly entrenched in his head and in his sort of conscious and unconscious thinking times, he was thinking, how could you do a Fourier transform um, in, in digitally in real time? Now, John O'Sullivan was into many things, and this part of the story most people uh, are less aware of. Westerbork is an array of equally spaced dishes. That means you measure the same Fourier component redundantly but through different atmosphere. And it was well known uh, that you could use something equivalent to adaptive optics to uh, correct for the atmosphere. And if you have, in fact, equal spacings like this and have measured the Fourier component many times, you can do this uh, in what's called redundant uh, spacing calibration. You can do it in a way which uh, is uh, independent of the structure in the source. So a very powerful technique. And he was one of a small group in the Netherlands who published a paper uh, about this, but they used this to prove in about half a page why adaptive optics, which was a technique becoming very popular in optical imaging and uh, required um, something like 10 pages uh, to prove that it actually worked. If you use this redundant spacing approach in the optical domain, they were able to show that all that happens in adaptive optics is you adjust the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the corrector so that all the Fourier components, which are equal and are very highly redundant in a single dish, are all lined up, and then you get the maximum signal. So he knew the physics of this as a result of writing that quite incredible uh, paper. OK, then continuing the, the, the chronology here, uh, Bob Freda had now become uh, the chief of the division of radio physics in CSIRO. Uh, Bob spent quite a lot of time uh, scourging the earth for wise people, expatriates, anybody he could lay his hands on that could help build this, uh, this castle in the air that he had conceived, the Australia Telescope. And of course, John O'Sullivan was a prime target, and uh, Bob brought him back to Australia. Um, didn't involve him in a group uh, working on um, either communications or, uh, or radio astronomy, but as somebody mentioned in medical imaging. Uh, however, John had all the pieces in his head for doing something different. He, he, uh, he realized that you can adaptively correct for a corrupting atmosphere. He knew that would work. We had done it. Uh, and he had also, by then, uh, realized his ambition to put a Fourier transform uh, on a single chip. And so uh, a chip was built that could do a Fourier transform. This is relevant because in order to separate out the Fourier components to play these clever adaptive optics games, you need to do Fourier transforms in real time. 
So then John realized that the multi-path problem, which plagues uh, um, the connections, uh, wireless connections to computers, was essentially an equivalent problem. And by breaking uh, the communication signal up into Fourier components, uh, you could either in the simple process pick the best ones, or in the more sophisticated process, realign the phases as you do in adaptive uh, calibration uh, to recover the signal at full bandwidth. John had another concept which I remember was very clear at the time. No point in Australia trying to make an incremental improvement because you'd be beaten by the Americans. So we had to do the kind of stuff that they weren't thinking about or considered impossible. So I remember I was there when he made the proposal to, to Bob Freighter that, hey, I reckon we could actually build a wideband wireless and make it work. And Bob said, well, you're bright and I take risks. And so uh, it all happened. Uh, they demonstrated they could do it. At the same time, David Skellum, uh, who was uh, another of the uh, co-students of John O'Sullivan, had been involved in the IEEE standards. Now, this is also interesting because a lot of people think, God, who's going to go to standards committees meetings? This must be the most boring part of the international uh, um, uh, union's uh, activities. Uh, um, but David was there and realized that there was the possibility of, uh, of implementing this wideband network uh, and made sure that uh, the standards included the 80211 option, which is basically the implementation of this scheme. So um, they got, uh, John has the, uh, with the group at CSIRO have a patent. David Skellen set up a small company that was later bought out by Cisco. Uh, and now uh, the wireless networks uh, are uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world. So boy, I, I think this is just a fascinating story. Just look at the steps which were involved. And one thing you've got to realize, back when we started looking for exploding black holes, the concept that this would eventually produce a broadband wireless network, it would, you couldn't possibly make those links. These things happen. You can't do this kind of planning uh, in advance. Now, I'm going to, John O'Sullivan is, after spending some time in industry, uh, decided that industry typically doesn't throw up hard enough problems. They want to make money. If you want to make money, you don't solve hard problems, you solve easy problems. And so uh, I remember uh, one of John's conversations was his frustration that uh, he wasn't really uh, getting the intellectual engagement from his role as, uh, as head of research in Cisco. And uh, he's come back part-time to work on the square kilometer array, which he decided was full of impossibly difficult problems. And so surely some would be uh, would, uh, would be something he could work on. Well, here he is, working on the checkerboard feed for uh, one of the possible ways of doing SKA. And I'll tell you some more about that later. Now, the next uh, experiment involving high time resolution pulses, um, I'll first of all just briefly show you what it is that we're trying to do. And we had the introduction to the uh, ultra high energy cosmic ray universe uh, uh, yesterday, so that's very helpful. So among the high en energy particles, the neutrinos are uh, pretty interesting. If one were to come from that direction, uh, the moon has a sufficient, uh, um, is big enough that the probability of an interaction is essentially one. So somewhere in the moon, but let's look at the ones where this happens near the surface. The neutrino will interact. The red uh, orange stuff there is the particle shower which is generated. And that particle shower can emit Cherenkov radiation. I'll give you a few more details in a second. Uh, even though the shower is below the surface of the moon, maybe 10, 100 meters deep is where we expect this will be happening, uh, the radio part of the Cherenkov emission uh, can escape. And so we can see it. The optical emission, which you normally use as a Cherenkov detector, can't work because uh, it the photons can't get out. Um, then uh, we take uh, your favorite telescope uh, somewhere uh, in the world and look for the photons, the radio photons generated from that interaction on the moon. Um, OK, well, uh, the, this, is, uh, this is good fun science. As Ravi says, I do like to do uh, 
exciting and interesting things. Um, and I, since what I can do is to use telescopes in unusual ways, I usually look for problems, I don't care what area of astrophysics it is, uh, which require um, some rather different use of a telescope. And then I may have some chance of rounding up a team of people who can uh, help me do such a thing. Um, OK, so back to the high energy cosmic rays. Um, not sure if it comes up later, so I'll say it now. The reason why we started this experiment was itself interesting. So the radio astronomy cosmic ray community got connected together when Shlovsky uh, pointed out the intimate connection between the continuum radio emission through the synchrotron process and cosmic rays. And from that time, there's been a reasonable alliance between the radio astronomy community, or some of them, uh, and the cosmic ray community. And as a result, I get occasional invitations to go to cosmic ray meetings. There was an international cosmic ray meeting in Adelaide, just as I arrived back in Australia from the VLA. Um, and I gave a review talk on what use radio astronomers might be to cosmic ray people. Uh, but there, were, uh, there was another talk uh, in this conference on the, uh, this uh, neutrino detection process um, by a um, Russian whose name I've currently forgotten. Um, but in Russia, they didn't have the radio technology to search for the nanosecond pulse, which is what this produces. Uh, I realized we could easily round up, we could probably round up people to do this experiment. So it was just uh, um, the luck of being at that conference. Uh, and then the second piece of luck was Tim Hankins had come as a visiting scientist to work on pulsars. Absolutely nothing to do with high energy neutrinos. So I get back to Epping, and there's, there's uh, Tim Hankins has just arrived. And I said, hey, do you know about these high energy cosmic rays? And it turned out he'd just uh, read some, uh, something in a review. Um, and we had John O'Sullivan uh, while he was working on other things like wideband communications. Uh, said, hey, let's, uh, so the team got together again, and um, John and Tim uh, designed the equipment uh, to do our first uh, experiment. Um, maybe this is a good time to mention the, uh, the importance of teams. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, you have so much more power when you can collect together uh, a group of people who are each expert in some aspect of a subject. And that team then uh, can do things, of course, which no individuals can do. And uh, you see my international focus coming out here a little bit. So yeah, individual science by individuals is good, but teams uh, are also good. But you need the flexibility to be able to get people together and motivate them to work on one problem. And in the environment we had in CSIRO, uh, with, uh, with Bob as, uh, as our director, that was very easy. Uh, it's a difficult experiment, um, mainly because the density of these guys is pretty low, and you need an enormous uh, collector detector. Uh, the area of the detector has to be enormous. So there are some uh, numbers there. Uh, two of these high energy neutrinos per square kilometer per day per steradian, if you Depending how you set up things, that's in fact the kind of area you would have in these experiments. Um, so it's very difficult to put in your lab a detector that big. Um, the, uh, the best other detectors for doing this experiment are using the entire uh, Antarctic ice pack, which is a pretty good detector. Uh, but the other pretty good detector is the moon. And this results from this paper by uh, Ascarion in the 60s, pointing out that these uh, the showers generated in the lunar regolith would make Cherenkov radiation. And the incredibly interesting thing he found, I suppose, does this have a pointer? Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll say it. Oh, the middle. Yeah, OK. Um, for the, if, if the shower is comparable uh, smaller than the wavelength that you're looking at, the process is coherent. 
So that's a hugely important factor, and that's what makes it detectable. That's also pretty much what determines the frequency range in which you're looking. The peak uh, particle production in these showers is, is just uh, tens of centimeters to a few meters long, and that means you get coherent radiation up to uh, a few gigahertz. And since it's coherent, all the electrons in the shower are adding, uh, uh, adding coherently, and you get a pulse which is detectable even when the target is as far away as the moon. So that's the background uh, to that. Um, uh, this, I just thought, was such a neat experiment, I've thrown it in. Um, well, do these showers actually occur? Would this happen? And this was an experiment that was done, led by uh, David Salzberg uh, at, at, uh, at uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. The bags of stuff they have there are actually uh, kitty litter, uh, because they search for cheap stuff they could find uh, which had a composition roughly like uh, the lunar regolith, and kitty litter came out as uh, suitable. So they put the bags of kitty litter inside of the linear accelerator at Stanford, again, taking a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking, um, sent particles into the, those bags, and in fact observed the Cherenkov uh, emission. So they were able to, uh, A, confirm that the effect uh, that Aska Carrion talked about worked, it was coherent, um, and uh, calibrate the, uh, a couple of the coefficients that were needed. <coughs> so, <coughs> with all that in hand, uh, we did our first experiment in Parks in uh, 1995. Um, through a, a NASA project, when they were keen on uh, building equipment to look for SETI, we happened to have on the Parkes telescope this very, for at the time, wideband receiver, 1.2 to 1.9 gigahertz. That's so you can search a whole lot of frequencies. And that's the receiver we bug it up around with to, uh, to get the 700 megahertz bandwidth out uh, to uh, search for these pulses. Um, and uh, so we, we looked for a while. We actually looked at the center of the moon, which was uh, an extremely bad thing to do. Uh, it's got a little bit of data looking at the edge for reasons which I won't go into, and uh, published this paper, published the limits, um, the, uh, and uh, I sort of pretty much forgot about it then. That had been a fun thing to do. Um, uh, the next thing I really knew about this experiment was, was when I got an invitation to go to a meeting in the U.S. called RADHEP radio high energy particle meeting. And uh, to my amazement, I was being invited to give a plenary talk as the uh, pioneer of, of this technique. But since I wasn't linked into the high energy physics community, we didn't realize that this was actually taken pretty seriously and was considered uh, quite interesting. And then I learned another thing about the high, really high energy physics community. It doesn't matter whether you detect things or not. They usually don't detect things. I mean, God, you detect things, and that's, uh, that's, that's Nobel Prize stuff. But they spend most of their life not detecting things. So the fact we didn't detect anything, you know, as astronomers, we thought, ah, well, we better go do something else. But uh, for particle physicists, you know, this was great stuff. I remember talking to a particle physics meeting, and I said, if we can do an order of magnitude better, then we might have another crack at this. And the guy said, but you only observe for a few days. Order of magnitude, you only have to observe for a few years, and, and you have it. And I said, yeah, but lots of other people want the telescope. We can't. He says, well, build your own. Why would that stop you? So it's a different community with a different uh, way of thinking. Uh, uh, I probably won't have time to get to that in the end. So let's go on. I think I'll have to go a bit faster. I wrote down here some of the issues that arise when trying to do this experiment. And this is where I want to get to Rad. Um, any of you who had discussions with Rad may recognize that almost everything on this list of issues we had to contend with to do this experiment are uh, topics which you've probably discussed with Rad. Well, I certainly have. So in order to design this experiment, I just drew on all of these discussions, discussions about the difference. You see, although we're detecting particles, which are obeying the quantum mechanics, so few photons uh, 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 per, per, uh, per wave packet, 
uh, we are doing it using classical radiation, uh, and we're in the Rayleigh genes limit. So things get muddled up pretty quickly between uh, thinking quantum and uh, thinking of the property of these radio photons. And who best uh, unscramble all this but RAD? And so uh, everything I know about this, I've learned from RAD pretty much. Um, when you're detecting pulses, 0.3, which are the reciprocal of your bandwidth, so in the radiometer equation, delta T, T cis over square root, delta mu, delta T, the bottom of this is 1. And so T cis is your noise. Uh, there's no, nothing else in this. And you have this uh, uh, fabulous effect that if you're looking at a source, like the moon, which is the dominant source of noise, if you increase, increase the area of your telescope, you increase the system temperature, and you get no improvement in sensitivity. So, hey, you've got to really think about this carefully. The normal ways of doing things uh, don't work. And of course, I only knew this because of Dan Rad and his questions and inquisitions and so on, uh, which taught me a lot. Uh, later, I'll tell you how the intensity interferometer gets into this as well. Um, uh, polarization uh, is, is beautiful, and I have a slide on that just to, just to touch on it, because I'd love to talk about every one of these topics. Uh, the real issue are the ones down the bottom. We want a lot of collecting area, uh, so we have sensitivity. Um, but as I just said, if we're looking at the moon, um, that's uh, not going to work. So I'll talk a bit about that, because it's dominating the noise, and all you get is more noise from the moon. So you've got to have, find some way to get around that. Um, in, in, under the cross-fertilization area, my particle physics student, who was absolutely fabulous in this project, because he didn't believe in it, somebody had a very wise remark, you don't, uh, uh, you, 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 uh, don't agree with what your supervisor says until you sort it through for yourself. It was said a little cleverer than that. Anyway, this Clancy, uh, Clancy James, was really good, and so I would say these things, and then he'd go away and do a physicist kind of analysis and come back. Um, he discovered we were affected by wavefront curvature. I hadn't even thought to include it uh, in the way we were analyzing the data. And finally, I'll get back to John O'Sullivan and his phase to Ray Feeds, because uh, uh, that's where we're going at the moment. Uh, start, we started a bit late, right, Robbie? So, some time yet. Um, Here's the basic requirements for this experiment. For radio astronomers in the audience, you can just scan those and uh, see the sort of things we need. Um, the minimum aperture to be get useful limits uh, is around uh, 20 meters, but we are now talking of tens or 100 times that to get really interesting uh, limits. Um, and you're certainly going to be talking about weeks of observing time during which you might get one pulse. So again, for radio astronomers, this is a bizarre way to work. You may only get one event, and you have to be able to prove that it's a real event and not a piece of noise. So for, for radio astronomers thinking, this is quite challenging stuff. Uh, but it's quite normal for particle physics. So it's, uh, here we see the cross-disciplinary stuff, which I think is very interesting. So as you talk to the particle physicists, you get very different uh, ideas and views about how to do experiments. Um, we are going to sample this data at a nanosecond, and I'll show you some of the results of doing this. We have succeeded in doing this very well. Uh, but you can't record data being sampled at 8 bits at a nanosecond. That exceeds current highest possible recording capacities in normal computers by a factor of uh, more than 10. So we have to detect this pulse in real time or detect the possibility that a running buffer's got a pulse in it in real time, and then we can dump that data to the computer and process it afterwards. This is absolutely crucial. So for all of you people who only think about, we'll fix it up later in software, we'll do all the clever tricks later in software, no, that's not an option. You can't do it that way. The clever tricks have to be done in real time, or else you won't get the sensitivity to detect this pulse. So this forces, and it was very interesting to watch this, uh, kids, of course, all love programming and are uh, really good at this, but they have to do their programming now in real time on an FPGA. Ah, that's a rather different hurdle to go over. And so they found it amazingly uh, different and stimulating to be forced to do things uh, 
in uh, uh, an engineering approach, basic, basically, which is what you need to solve these problems. Um, I'm going to have to skip a fair bit of the details. Let's see, what do we have here? We have a few issues uh, to consider. Um, we've mostly been doing our experiment between 1 and 3 gigahertz. We've done two experiments. I'll show you both uh, briefly, and I'll show you the last experiment just done a few weeks ago in a bit more detail because it was really great fun and might even be interesting. Um, we, since this stuff is coming from the moon, we don't have to worry about the interstellar dispersion. So now the nanosecond time resolution becomes uh, absolutely, it becomes possible and it becomes critical. But now the ionosphere uh, is giving us enough dispersion to be a problem, some tens to up to 50 uh, nanoseconds at the frequency we're using. And you have to coherently de-disperse it. That is, you've got to uh, realign all those Fourier components, get their phases coherently added, or you will not get the sensitivity. Sure, you can break it into bands and do incoherent detection on each of them, but you're going to be orders of magnitude off the sensitivity we need to achieve. So again, we've got to de-disperse this thing, and we've got to do it in a nanosecond so that we can test every possible pulse. That is extremely challenging, even for the fastest FPGAs uh, now available. So that meant the team has to include somebody who can actually do this, and Paul Roberts, engineer from CSIRO, uh, is really the hero of this because he just loves working with these things, clocks running at 2 gigahertz, and doing reasonably complicated logic with only one nanosecond to do it, and many operations in parallel. Uh, Right, so polarization, I'll, I'll, get, I'll say a little bit more about in a, a slide in a minute. Um, uh, we've got interference. There's lots of other things to make uh, pulses. I'll show you some a bit later. Uh, so we've got to separate out things that came from the moon uh, from things that didn't. And in fact, we pretty much use particle physics techniques here. That is coincidence and anti-coincidence detection techniques. And this all worked extremely well. Um, hardware issues, uh, again, for anybody who's interested in hardware, just to give you a feel for uh, what's going on. We're taking advantages of the excellent receivers uh, available to looking at the moon. They don't have to be that good. But as you will see as I go on, uh, we also need to have some not looking at the moon. Um, so we do need good receivers. That's automatically available, they're cryogenically cooled, they have dual orthogonal polarization, so we can tap into all of this infrastructure that's there. Uh, we, we try to get the widest bandwidth we can, which means we bypass almost all of the back end of the telescope and get hold of the output of the first uh, amplifier, in case of Parks, up at the focus, so back to old-fashioned astronomy, with astronomers going up and down to the focus cabin. Uh, in uh, the way which uh, Rad would have done many times, but hasn't been done for years. In fact, most experiments uh, are uh, done from an air-conditioned control room, but we couldn't do that. Um, this was the first board we were using. The new one is even a little tidier, but it shows which kind of devices are being used uh, to do this. And uh, we have uh, the maximum onboard memory that we can stick on this FPGA, uh, which is a buffer while we decide whether there's a pulse, we can store about a microsecond, few microseconds worth of data at one nanosecond resolution. Then we ask, is that worth keeping? And a few hundred times a second, uh, we make a decision to keep, at it, keep it and look at it later. Um, as I said, we're in this regime where delta T is one over the uh, bandwidth of the system. Um, we're doing two experiments. One has about 350 megahertz of bandwidth, the other one about 700. So between uh, one and a half nanoseconds and one nanosecond for Nyquist sampling this stuff. Um, just a little piece of uh, rad stuff here. Um, if you look at, in this uh, small interval, the uh, energy per, uh, per photon, um, you discover that uh, this is very much less than one in the radio. So one of these fluctuations, which is the smallest possible fluctuation you can get, uh, because that's all that the system will support uh, at the bandwidth you're using, uh, you're in the Rayleigh genes uh, regime because uh, there are many, many uh, photons in every one of those fluctuations. 
Um, this is very unlike the situation over the other side of the Rayleigh genes where the shortest possible fluctuation will often have no photons. So that's photon counting. Uh, we are pulse counting, uh, but the pulses themselves have lots of photons. So we can do operations on these pulses like amplifying them, uh, splitting them up, uh, looking at the signal many different ways without any loss in signal to noise. Again, all of this is thanks to Rad explaining many things. Now, here's another rather neat one. Um, I'm glad to be able to pop up a Poincaré sphere, introduced to me, of course, by, uh, by Rad. Um, and in fact, pretty much all of the polarization knowledge we needed to design this experiment, you find in his wonderful tutorial at the uh, Ursi General Assembly uh, in Prague. And uh, that's where I grabbed this particular picture of the Poincaré sphere. Um, what uh, becomes obvious after you've been doing it for a while, but it first takes radio astronomers by surprise, is that uh, any pulse, which is a reciprocal of your bandwidth, has to be 100% polarized. It, it's got no other options. The concept of, uh, of uh, unpolarized radiation is just the sum of many random polarization states in the system. But we only have one state with delta with, in this situation. So every pulse we look at has to be 100% linearly polarized. So now the theoreticians say, hey, you know, we've got a prediction for you. These pulses are going to be 100% linear polarized. Well, whatever makes a pulse like that has to be 100% linear polarized. So that particular prediction adds no value. However, they do predict that the pulses are going to lie, um, are going to be linear, not uh, randomly, polar, not uh, uh, elliptically polarized, uh, and they will lie around the equator and the Poincaré sphere. And furthermore, depending where on the limb they come from, uh, you can predict the angle of the linear polarization. Um, what we decided to do in our experiment in the end, although it cost a little bit more effort, we actually align the orthogonal linear feeds with the limb of the moon. So we get all of the good signal down one channel and basically a comparison orthogonal polarized signal down the other. Normally, again, you'd fix all this up afterwards in software, but ah, we can't do that. We have to do it in real time. And after we looked at trying to generate this polarized signal out of the two orthogonals, uh, even in fast digital hardware, turned out easier to rotate the feed and use a mechanical device. And uh, probably, Ravi, I need to, how much longer? Five, all right, then I gotta go really fast. Okay, um, if we have two antennas, we can use the timing to work out whether it came from the moon or not. We have to do it to a few nanoseconds. That's actually not hugely difficult for radio astronomers, uh, but has very impressed the particle physicists who don't get close to this kind of timing, uh, OJ, for example. Um, I'm going to, um, let's see, all right, um, as I said, the ionosphere is actually, uh, uh, comes into this. We can actually use it to our advantage. Terrestrial RFI, a little yellow thing there, uh, uh, misses the ionosphere. Uh, even moon bounce would go through the ionosphere twice, and the real signal um, coming through the interstellar medium, well, the neutrino isn't affected, so we don't have to worry about that. So all of that sorts itself out quite nicely. This illustrates um, the game we have to play to do the detection. On the horizontal axis is the neutrino energy. There's a bunch of theories shown there. Um, the um, CR induced is the fact that the high energy cosmic rays, which have been observed, are interacting with the microwave background. Uh, and producing in that interaction neutrinos as one of the byproducts. So that's the GZK effect. Um, there's a bunch of uh, other models. Uh, these are the experimental limits coming down from the top. Uh, and as the limits come down, these models, which are, tend to be the cosmological production of high energy neutrinos, uh, they adjust their parameters, each new experiment, to sit underneath the limit. And it doesn't seem to bother them very much. So prediction or not prediction? I don't know, but it makes it interesting to try for. Um, what I just wanted to show here is that we've got two things we can vary. Uh, we can vary the place where we have the energy sensitivity. 
uh, that's uh, uh, partly determined by the frequency you use and how much uh, uh, what your neutrino flux uh, limit is. Um, and so these are the two parameters. But I think I better go on and show you some stuff. So we'll skip over that. Um, this is kind of important uh, because this uh, is demonstrating the fact that picking the antenna to use is quite tricky. Uh, the green line, um, uh, so we have, uh, so the system temperature, the pink line, is increasing as you increase the uh, antenna diameter um, because of uh, the fact I mentioned earlier. So the signal to noise there, which is uh, yellow, stops increasing as soon as the uh, uh, antenna is more than about 10 meters in size. So you get to this plateau. Uh, then, uh, <clears throat> then if you make your telescope bigger, well, then it starts seeing less of the moon. So, OK, your system temperature stops increasing. In fact, it's reached the temperature of the moon. So that's not going to get worse. But the volume of your detector is going down. So either way, you're caught here between, uh, between these two curves. And you have to do clever things to get around this. And the clever thing is to basically use a multiplex advantage. So you get your volume back by working out how you can simultaneously observe uh, many parts of the moon with a large collecting area many times. The obvious way to try and do that is, well, let's use an array of dishes. Uh, so uh, each of these dishes uh, is seeing all the moon. We can do many experiments at once uh, using many dishes of a compact array. But because the TSIS is dominated by the moon, uh, lo and behold, you're exactly into the uh, intensity interferometer uh, regime. And if you did that experiment, you would get no improvement because the intensity fluctuations which dominate your noise are exactly the same on each of the two antennas. So that doesn't work. So you've got to put them far enough apart to resolve the moon and get rid of the intensity interferometer effect. But when you do that, if you want to get full sensitivity, you've got to combine the signals in phase from each of them uh, before you detect. And that means your resolution is becoming higher and higher. So you've got to combine them in all the possible phases for every possible location on the moon. So this all gets very interesting, but I'll now move in my last few minutes to show you some results. So um, sort of skip over this, but you could have uh, uh, an array in a big dish, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, this way so that you see many patches of the moon at once. Uh, or uh, you could have a coherent beamforming array with a bunch of telescopes like this. And you could phase them up so you get all the different stripes. So these are two different experiments we've been trying. And I'll switch and show you some results. Here's a compact array uh, and with, uh, with the moon. A beautiful picture uh, uh, taken while we were observing there. Some of the people uh, involved. Um, for a team, you need. Uh, somebody who doesn't do anything like me, uh, somebody who can do this uh, digital signal processing, somebody who can interface that digital signal processor to a computer, which is a very big uh, issue. A um, couple of particle physicists, and Ray Prothero, who's the world's expert on high energy neutrinos, uh, and an engineering student from Melbourne who did most of her work uh, correcting for the ionosphere in ways which I won't tell you about. Um, I've pretty much described that system. I'll move past it. I can't possibly pass up on this uh, fabulous uh, uh, de-dispersion filter uh, invented uh, by Paul Roberts. Um, it's, uh, the fact that it's circular doesn't matter so much. It's just so it can put a very long thing there. But if you look closely, the width of these microwave strips changes continuously around the circle. And what happens is different fraction of the signals gets reflected at different times. And it turned out he discovered that uh, Schrodinger's equation could be used to determine the distribution of widths along this to generate a de-dispersed pulse. And I thought, this is an engineer working in our group. Rad would be pleased with something like this. This is the kind of stuff that uh, uh, is really exciting. Uh, a fun thing, Rad, uh, while we were observing, we didn't plan this. We have many spacings of the interferometer. And in fact, these are displayed in real time. Each of the spacings is a different color. And so as we were doing the first observation, 
wow, there's the Fourier transform of the moon, which just appears because, of course, the thermal emission is in all our noise. And it is a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, Bessel function with only very slight deviations, in fact. So watching that build up in real time, uh, again, it, it, these are toys. We really like this stuff and uh, love to play with them. I'll skip that messy lot, but if anybody wants to talk to me later, a side effect of this experiment has been we can determine the location of pulsed RFI with incredible uh, discrimination by using both the timing and the curvature of the wavefront. Uh, and RFI in our buffer, if it's CW RFI, well, there it is. That's the actual oscillation at uh, around a gigahertz up and down being sampled at a half a nanosecond. And so it's the actual voltage of the waveform, which we can dig into. There's both polarizations and three antennas. Uh, RFI, which is a bit more annoying, might look uh, something uh, like this. This stuff is, uh, is about uh, 20, 30 nanoseconds. The real pulse can only be one nanosecond. So we know that's RFI. And, but we can study all of this RFI. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about RFI in a minute. So summary there. Uh, we didn't detect anything which we considered were neutrinos, and we put a new limit on the diagram. But we want to do better. And it turns out the array is extremely difficult to do the next step. Because when you try and phase up in real time all these elements to better than a nanosecond, that requires, it's all feasible, but it starts to require really serious hardware. So we gave up and decided, well, let's use the surface of a big parabolic dish to phase the signal up, go back to parks, but in order so that we can get the multiplex advantage, uh, use many of the beams of this uh, famous Parks multi-beam receiver, which is what we did. There's the size of the moon. So you see this is, uh, well, the angular size of the moon uh, projected onto there. Uh, so here's how the experiment goes. There's the moon. We bring the multi-beam. These are the inner parts of the multi beam And we stick it right there. Um, so we have, we're looking near the limb, but we're avoiding the inner part of the moon, which has just got noise and no good signal. Uh, we've got enough hardware to do orthogonal polarizations on four beams, are the four we picked. We did it that way because any neutrinos coming from Centaurus A, which is a possible source of high energy um, uh, cosmic rays, uh, will be uh, seen when they hit the moon uh, in, the, in that part of the limb. So that's, in a sense, our most interesting experiment. Um, we have um, RFI. And that's where this very high sensitivity beam not looking at the moon has proved to be enormously valuable. So that's an anti-coincidence circuit is set up to make sure that if this thing sees anything, uh, we blank the other guys. Uh, we call it a veto pulse. That works brilliantly. We put our RFI false event rate from 20,000 down to a few, just by having this veto machine. So that's actually been brilliant. Here's some RFI. Um, and where's my next picture? Ah, yes. So here's uh, some typical RFI. So we started puzzling about what this is. We know it's RFI because uh, we see it on every one of these beams. What you see in these buffers is the two linear polarizations about to four microseconds worth of data with one nanosecond resolution. So there's pulses here, which are RFI, and they're about a tenth of a microsecond long. They're seen in both polarizations uh, and they're seen in all the beams. So we know they're coming in through the side lobes, uh, therefore RFI. So wonder what this RFI is. And at the opening of LOFAR uh, a few months, a month ago, um, they did an experiment. LOFAR is set up to detect atmospheric cosmic ray showers. And so they have a pulse detector on the low frequency array. And the pulse detector part is already working. And, then, um, and so uh, they had this Windhurst machine sitting near the uh, low fire array. You turn the handle, get electrostatic discharge. And every time it discharges, all the lights go on in the low fire antennas. You get a pulse of electromagnetic radiation. Beautiful demonstration of electromagnetic uh, wave generation. So we were at Parks. And we had a god-awful piece of machinery and junk to generate a pulse so that we knew that we could see something. So we had a pulse generator. Then we had a huge uh, RF amplifier, because to get enough energy within a nanosecond using these techniques was actually hard. We drag it up to the, to the uh, inside of the dish so we can make 
artificial pulses. So having seen that, we're thinking, well, the Wimshurst machine would be nice, but maybe other things that generate sparks would be nice. So uh, we went to the quarters and found the barbecue lighter. Uh, here, courtesy of, uh, of Ravi, I have his, uh, his, uh, his, his lighter. It's a piezoelectric machine, and you press it, and, and you get the sparks. I don't know if you can see them or not. So we get one of these, walk outside the Parkes telescope, press the button, and bingo, we get a perfect nanosecond pulse. We can use it for timing. We can sit in the dish and press the piezoelectric oven lighter. But the other message is it is very easy to generate these nanosecond pulses. It's, uh, presumably, it's the breakdown of the air. The piezoelectric crystal itself can't do it. So it's the time scale for the, uh, for the breakdown uh, which generates a nanosecond pulse. And before Ravi uh, really uh, get into trouble here, um, so we have determined that most of that RFI we're seeing is automobile ignition uh, generated. Um, and in fact, when looking at the web to see what's known about this nanosecond pulses coming out of automobiles, it turns out there is something known about it. And the modern cars with all the electronic junk, all the electronic junk, it doesn't run fast enough to make nanosecond pulses. However, these nanosecond pulses have enough energy to wipe out digital components in the computers. So they actually have to have very heavy suppression in, uh, in these cars to, uh, to make the computers work uh, in the presence of all of this uh, RFI. This is the kind of stuff we're looking for. Um, this is a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, pulse. It has uh, all the properties we want. It's about 8.1 sigma, so you might think, hey, we go straight to, uh, straight to nature with that. But we are taking a sample of data uh, every nanosecond, which means 10 to the 9 of them per second. And we've been observing uh, for, for uh, a few weeks now of integration time. So you actually uh, get one or two events at 8 sigma from pure noise. So one uh, isn't quite enough. Um, it does have all the good properties. It's seen in, uh, in, in, in one polarization channel, and in this case, the correct one. There's nothing seen in any of these other beams. Um, and uh, we actually see no interference which has all of those properties. So we believe we are counting potential real events. Um, the, uh, and the bottom line is right at the moment, we do see more than we expect. We're talking about uh, 16 events where prediction was 4 or 5. And if we add in one beam, we see 12 events with a prediction of 2. So this is all looking quite exciting. The catch is we're seeing it in, not in the beam, which is the one the theorists predicted it would be in. It's supposed to be very limb brightened, and we see most of the events in the beam inside the moon. So this is a work in progress. Don't talk about it yet. We're not claiming, we, we're certainly not claiming we've detected anything. But it's really interesting. And it's been interesting to get such clean signals out. Um, the future is going to be shown in this diagram. We have limits at the moment. I got the wrong one here. Well, we haven't put it on yet. Our limits will be sitting around the ANITA limits, that red dashed line. That's the solar uh, ice cap experiment. Um, with the collecting area of the SKA, you get seriously interesting limits, and I think that's where the future is. Uh, however, we can do much better. We had only those three beams on parks. We can use John O'Sullivan and his phased array feed to make as many beams on the moon as we want by the way we phase up this phased array feed. So, and in fact, this is my final comment. So we're now working with John on a machine to do this. Now, I'll set uh, a, a, a problem for Rad and anyone else. Since you can do that, we could make a beam which was precisely matched to the limb of the moon. So then we'd have one beam, just the right shape. So wouldn't that be a good thing to do? So yes or no, and you can discuss that with me later. Um, and by the way, for the techno people, this checkerboard array is a self-complementary antenna, connected patch array, differential amplifiers at the vertices. Uh, this has never been used in radio astronomy before. It is incredibly interesting. It is incredibly innovative. John O'Sullivan has got a problem which is uh, stretching his brain again. And uh, this has all been uh, great fun. Thank you.
the, uh, the emission, I'm not sure, the two, there could be two answers here. We measure both orthogonal polarization simultaneously, which means once we've got a trigger, we've sampled both of those. We have the voltages. We kept the voltages so we can calculate uh, where it is on the Poincaré sphere or the Stokes parameters, however you want to look at it. So we can calculate for every one of those pulses what the position angle is. So that's the experimental side. The theoretical side relates the emission from the Cherenkov comes out on this Cherenkov cone, and it's, uh, the polarization is radially distributed around the cone. If you look at the geometry, the, the showers we see, which come up through the surface at that point on the limb, it selects that piece of the cone, and that's why the polarization is predicted 